we're having a look at historical novels. And I thought this was a rather wonderful quote. History tells us what people do. Historical fiction helps us imagine how they felt. Now, as a teenage reader, I learned a lot of history from novels. When I was a teenager, I never read any history books. I just read novels set in different eras of history. And that really is the way that my interest in history was sparked. And I learned a huge amount about different historical eras. Probably I picked up on uh, the odd misfact or misconception. But over time, I was able to sort all of that out. Now, let's begin with how one defines an historical novel. And of course, that is not always a simple business. So historical fiction is a literary genre in which the imagined plot takes place in the setting of a particular real historical event. So you're moving back in time to a particular era where certain things very definitely happened, and you're placing imaginary characters into that historical era. Or perhaps you're choosing real characters from that era, and you're giving them a fictional life. So historical novels have to be set in the past, they have to pay attention to the customs and manners of the era. You can't, for example, have somebody in a 19th century novel talking about making a call on their mobile phones. You know, you've got to, of course, pay attention to what was available at the time, the conditions of the era. You can include real historical people if you wish to. There's no ban on historical novelists doing that particular thing. But it really is vital in historical fiction to have some sense of authenticity. So you've got to use words from the era. You know, you can't go talking about Wi-Fi or emails or whatever in a novel set 50 years ago because those things simply weren't there. You really need the historical authenticity. Now, critics vary in their definitions of what make an historical novel. And so I'll give you some of these definitions and you can think about those for yourselves. According to one critic, an historical novel needs to have been written at least 50 years after the events described in the fiction. So if you're writing a novel about World War II, for example, you can't write that until about the year 2000 if you want it to be considered historical fiction. Another critic says that it needs to be before the birth of the author. So if you were born in 1960, you can write a book about World War II because it was before you were born. Another critic says it needs to be set before the middle of the 20th century. So, you know, around about the, the 1950s. And it's very clear in an historical novel, the writer needs to be writing from research and not from personal experience. So it can't be something that the writer has actually experienced. So he or she has got to have done a certain amount of historical research to learn about that particular era in fiction. Now, there's no doubt that historical fiction has won some Nobel Prizes. This is one fascinating example. The Norwegian writer Sigrid Unset, who wrote her wonderful series called Kristen Lovransdata, which is set in Norway in the Middle Ages. And for that book, the author needed to research Catholicism. She needed to research the types of homes that people lived in, what sort of clothing they wore, what foods were available for them to eat. And she did it so well that she ended up in 1928 winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. So historical fiction can be superbly done, or of course, it can also be very badly done indeed. Now, really, it all started with Sir Walter Scott, who wrote Waverley, which is generally considered to be the first historical novel. And Scott had made his fame as a poet. He was wonderfully successful, praised by everybody. Then Lord Byron came along and started writing poetry. And Sir Walter Scott thought, oh, dear, I think I've been a bit outclassed here. Maybe I'll try my hand at a novel. 
Originally, he published it anonymously, but Waverley is set in the time of the Jacobite Rebellion, and as you can see from the subtitle, 60 years before Scott was writing the novel. So certainly in the living memory of many people in Scotland who would have been able to check that he was historically being very accurate. The book was a bestseller. It was the first of many books that Scott wrote that were phenomenally popular, and many of those books were historical novels, like Kenilworth, set in the time of Elizabeth I, or Ivanhoe, set way back in the Middle Ages. So Scott was very fond of historical fiction. He did it very well with lots of detail. And so it's hardly surprising that today the Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction bears his name. This prize started in the year 2010, and it's valued at £25,000. So it is a very nice prize to win. But the judges for this prize claim that the, the events in any of the books that are entered for the prize have to have taken place more than 60 years ago. So I think they've picked up on that subtitle of Waverley, to 60 years since, and they feel that uh, the events in the book have to be at least 60 years old. But I guess really it all depends on how you yourself define an historical novel. Is it all going to be set before our lifetimes? I think most of us would agree that a book set in World War II is an historical novel. But is a book set in the Vietnam War an historical novel? Well, it all depends on how you date it and how you make that decision. Now, historical novels have often been phenomenally popular. This is one great example. And they have fueled all sorts of important social changes. When Victor Hugo wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame de Paris, as the French title goes, the building of Notre Dame was in a terrible state of disrepair. It was very likely to be pulled down. And when Victor Hugo wrote this book, it gave such an interest in Gothic architecture, in ancient buildings in Paris, that a committee was set up to make sure that Notre Dame Cathedral was saved. And some years ago, of course, there was that terrible fire in Notre Dame, and donations poured in from around the world to save this wonderful building and to make sure that everything would be repaired. So I think Victor Hugo's novel is a wonderful example of how historical fiction can bring about social change, can awaken social consciences, and can make people aware that certain things really need to be done. And so really this particular historical novel fueled the whole movement to establish the Monument Historique in France, so the Historic Monuments Preservation. So if a particular building has a, a plaque put on it from the Historic Monuments Preservation, that of course helps to save it. And so much of that came from this one historical novel by Victor Hugo. So Walter Scott, with his fiction, created an enormous interest in Scottish nationalism and pride and history. And uh, he, again, did an enormous amount through the historical fiction that he wrote. And there are pluses to historical fiction in that an author is looking back with perspective. He or she is not writing about the actual times he's living in. He or she is able to look back with the help maybe of some history books and to think about particular historical events from a certain distance and perspective. And I think that can help enormously. You're perhaps not so swept up in the events of the time. You can describe them more impartially and perhaps more fairly than a contemporary author can describe particular events that are going on in their era. So many, of course, write books that are based on particular events. Kidnapped is one example. Robert Louis Stevenson was looking back to the time of the Jacobite rebellions, and he was thinking about how his country, Scotland, was so divided, north, south, Jacobite, non-Jacobite, uh, and he captures that so wonderfully in what I think is one of the greatest novels ever written, Kidnapped. I absolutely adore Kidnapped. 
And of course, Leo Tolstoy with War and Peace was looking back to the time of the French invading Russia and everything that went on during that time. And Tolstoy includes real generals, real people who were taking part in these major political events, and he includes them as characters in his novel. Barnaby Rudge, Dickens's novel about the Gordon riots. It's a very tumultuous time in London, and he is describing those riots in his novel with some fictional, but also some real characters. Historical <laughs> novels are a very popular genre indeed. They were incredibly popular in the 19th mm -hmm. century. If you think of Charles Dickens with A Tale of Two Cities and Barnaby Rudge, Vanity Fair, George Eliot's novel Romola, Charles Kingsley's novel Westward Ho, James Fenimore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans, Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter, Balzac, Victor Hugo, Alexandre Dumas with The Three Musketeers, the Italian writer Manzoni with his novel The Beloved. So hugely popular novels. But as you can see from these more recent versions, historical novels are still hugely popular today. I, as a teenager, was completely addicted to I, Claudius by Robert Graves, wonderfully acted on television by Derek Jacoby, and I also read the novels. I'm also a huge Poldark fan. I've watched lots of Poldark. I recently read the Robert Harris book, Act of Oblivion, which was a very interesting novel about the man who signed the order that meant that Charles I had his head chopped off very much based on his good historical research and a really excellent book. So historical writers are busy today. Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth about the building of a great English cathedral in the Middle Ages. All of these books have been very, very popular books. All the Light You Cannot See by Anthony Dewar, set in the beautiful French town of St. Malo, about a young blind girl set back in the time of the war. So these are just a few examples of really excellent historical novels. And of course, we must mention Hilary Mantel with her wonderful novel, Wolf Hall. And she, of course, has won Booker Prizes. So she was basing it very much on real characters from the Tudor era. And of course, she did amazing research and a really wonderful job with all of her books. So those are just some wonderful examples of historical fiction. But we do, with historical novels, get a lot of sub-genres. And one of those is historical romance. And for me, one of the very best of those writers is the fabulous Georgette Heyer, who sets most of her novels in the Regency era. She was incredibly careful with her research, finding out how much a, a new dress or a bonnet cost, what sort of carriage was the equivalent of the Rolls Royce, what was the fashionable food to eat, where did people go, was it to Bath or to Brighton. The research is absolutely impeccable, and that comes through very strongly in all of her Regency romances. Because I think of Georgette Heyer, the Regency has remained a particularly popular era for historical romance. Uh, I'm not quite sure why that is. Perhaps it's less straight-laced than the Victorian era that followed it. Uh, but so many writers have set historical romances in the time of the Regency. Then, of course, we get historical crime novels. And my absolute favourite, he of his cat, is the fabulous author C.J. Sansom, who sets his series of crime novels in the time of King Henry VIII, moving through to the time of his son, Edward, and really showing quite wonderfully, I think, the tremendous stress of living in that era, when you weren't quite sure if your religion was going to be the royal religion of the day, were you going to need to change it quite rapidly? Nobody knew. And his major character is a lawyer, Matthew Shardlake. Fabulous character. I, I really love him. He travels around England as he solves various crimes. So for me, this is one of the very best examples of historical crime. But there are so many others, from the Brother Cadfell novels, which were hugely popular, S.J. Paris, who also sets her novels in uh, the Tudor era, the time of uh, Elizabeth I, 
Miss Anna Dean, the, or the Regency novel that you can see there, uh, set in the time of Jane Austen. Umberto Eco's hugely popular book, The Name of the Rose, set in the medieval period. Jacqueline Winspear's novel, Maisie Dobbs, set between the wars. I've very much enjoyed the Maisie Dobbs series. Lindsay Davis, uh, her series featuring a character called Falco, Marcus Didius Falco, is set in ancient Rome. Imogen Robertson, another delightful novelist, she sets her books in the Georgian era. And then if you can see the picture up the top, C.S. Harris, again, Regency crime. And down the, in the bottom corner, Nicola Upson, who sets her novels really in the sort of 1920s, 30s and 40s. Uh, and she actually takes as one of her major characters the crime novelist Josephine Tay. So those are just a very few of the fabulous examples that are around today of historical crime. So you can choose your era, but obviously you've got to get the details right. You've got to know what people were able to eat, what they wore, how they traveled around the country, what sort of words they would have been using. And so an historical novelist has to check on those details and make sure that they don't add terrible clangers to their books by getting something totally wrong. Another fashion at the moment is to choose a real author and to create historical mystery novels featuring that author. Needless to say, Jane Austen has appeared in many and some recent ones have just come out. But Stephanie Barron has done a whole series featuring Jane Austen as the sleuth, solving various mysteries. Giles Brandreth has done a great series on Oscar Wilde, where he shows the wonderful, witty Oscar trying to work out what's gone wrong when a crime has been committed and who committed it. And more recently, Jessica Fellows, who has gone through the various Mitford sisters. So she has done a series of six novels featuring the six different Mitford girls. So those, of course, are all set early 20th century, moving through into the, into the 40s. So some authors have decided to pick up on real authors and to make those characters the major character of their fiction. There have also been books that pick up on real people from history, but not necessarily authors. So The Girl with a Pearl Earring, another great bestseller by Tracy Chevalier, did, of course, look at that amazing artist Vermeer, particularly his most famous painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring. The Paris Wife was about the first of the four wives of Ernest Hemingway when Hemingway was living in Paris and struggling as a young writer. So that deals with, uh, with the first wife, Hadley. And it's an excellent book. I've really enjoyed Paula McLean's books. Many years ago, and I read this one as a teenager, Irving Stone's The Agony and the Ecstasy about the great artist Michelangelo and, of course, his creation of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and how he came to create that great work of art. And very recently, uh, Philippa Gregory with books like the, the Other Berlin Girl and many other historical novels has been hugely popular. Not, in my view, always entirely accurate, I have to say, but very, very popular. And uh, so a lot of people are learning their history from Philippa Gregory. So it's interesting to see these real characters like one of the Berlins or, or Ernest Hemingway and his wife or Michelangelo or Vermeer becoming the major characters in historical novels. Another form or another subgenre of historical fiction is the Gothic novel. And Jane Austen in Northanger Abbey famously pilloried the fashion for the Gothic novel. And this whole genre of fiction was started by Horace Walpole, son of the first British Prime Minister, Horace Walpole, and he wrote The Castle of Otranto, which today I think most of us find rather dated and not a particular exciting read but it's interesting to read from an historical point of view and to think that really most of our modern crime fiction stems from this book 
and it was hugely popular, gave people a real taste for the gothic. Everyone wanted to feel shivers of excitement and to be terrified. And uh, Ladies faint very frequently in these novels. And so the whole genre of gothic historical fiction was a very important genre indeed, and one picked up on and satirized by Jane Austen. I also have to report that historical (laughs) porn novels are very popular indeed. Now, I can't say I have read any of these titles. They're what I found on the web, but I think they give you some idea. Once again, evidently, the Regency period is particularly popular for porn rather than the more straight-laced Victorian era or the time of the war when people had other things to think about. But Regency porn is evidently very, very big today. But it is a subgenre of historical fiction. Then you get family sagas, and many of us have enjoyed making our way through family sagas set in the past. Thomas Mann's Buddenbrooks is a famous example, dealing with different generations of a family in Germany. Poldark, of course, is another example. We have Ross and Demelza, but then we get their children, and it moves on through the generations. So family sagas is another important subgenre of historical fiction. And, of course, we get nautical historical fiction. I put this in really mainly because I like to have a look at Ian Griffith, uh, who I think was absolutely gorgeous as Hornblower, an incredibly handsome guy. But the C.S. Forrester Hornblower novels were hugely popular, as was the television adaptation with Ian Griffith. And you get plenty of swashbuckling stuff and piracy at sea and battles at sea. So it all makes for very exciting historical fiction. And of course, uh, Patrick O'Brien picked up on that quite wonderfully in his uh, Aubrey and Maturin series. And I know there are many fans who have made their way through every single Patrick O'Brien book they could get their hands on. Captain Blood is another example of that particular genre. I believe that historical fantasy is also a very, very popular subgenre. Personally, I'm not hugely into fantasy, so this is not an area where I tend to look for my books, but some of you may really enjoy historical fantasy. So this, yet again, is a subgenre. And then, of course, there's children's historical fiction as well. And it's a way in which children can learn about different eras in history. I think the huge plus of an historical novel is that it teaches us about history in a very enjoyable way. As a teenager, these were two of my very favorite books by Anya Seaton, actually an American novelist. I adored The Winthrop Woman about Elizabeth Winthrop, who, as one of the members of the Puritan family, travels from England to America in the time of King Charles II and has to make a new life for herself in America. And I also loved Catherine by Anya Seaton. Uh, about a young woman who actually became the sort of ancestress of many of the kings of England. She was the mistress of John of Gaunt. So I loved Anya Seaton's novel, Catherine. And I think both of these books were very meticulously researched. So her history was extremely accurate. I have reread both since my teenage years and loved them once again. So these, for me, were two books that taught me a lot of history and made me realize that a very good writer can bring the past alive so vividly that you really believe as a reader that you're there in the time of John of Gaunt or the time of King Charles II or the early Puritan days in America. So she's one of my, has been one of my favorite historical novelists. But those are just some of the writers that I have enjoyed or ones that I felt needed to be mentioned today. So what I hope is that I have made it fairly clear for you how to define an historical novel. 